In search of the prototype of forced marriage, the Ongwen case and Bush wives phenomenon, Ligelia Quackle Bean, Journal of International Criminal Justice, published, the 11th of July, 2024, abstract. This article discusses the categorization of the phenomenon of Bush wives as forced marriage under the residual category of other inhumane acts. In the Ongwen case, it reveals how judges at the International Criminal Court have used an Aristotelian approach to characterization which entailed them to examine, on the basis of a jurisprudentially established checklist, whether the Bush wives phenomenon shares the properties of the crime category of other inhumane acts, by discussing the forced marriage practices through an other inhumane acts categorization. This article reveals the limits and pitfalls of the Aristotelian approach. The main problem is that the Aristotelian approach fails to grasp that categorization does not merely work on the basis of a checklist logic, but also is a culturally determined process in which cultural prototypes need to be examined. This article's main proposition is to consider an alternative way of categorization drawing from the philosophy of language and social sciences, and suggests judges adopt a prototype approach. This approach enables judges to move away from a generic way of labeling different fact patterns through a checklist of properties and take on a more tailor-made and culturally sensitive approach that involves categorization through the discussion of the similarity and distinctiveness of a certain fact pattern to a prototype. In this way, judges can diversify interpretation of the other inhumane acts category in light of local practices as it requires a fresh decision of the facts by engaging with cultural practices in a more sensitive way, and examining whether this phenomenon entails prototypical marriage practices. In this way, prototype theory opens new pathways in terms of how we label cultural practices and how we use the residual category of other inhumane acts. 1. Introduction one of the reasons why Ongwen will be a case talked about for a long time to come is the International Criminal Court ICC trial chamber's qualification of the Bush wives phenomenon as the crime of forced marriage under the other inhumane act category OIA in Article 7, 1, K of the Rome Statute. In Uganda, the Lord Resistance Army LRA abducted young girls and took them to the bush where, depending on their sexual maturity, they were first used as household servants king tings, or immediately given as wives to the Lord's Resistance Army, LRA, commanders. The girls were subjected to a range of sexual and non-sexual violence, including but not limited to household labor and chores, taking care of upbringing of the children, rape and other sexual and violent acts. In the Ongwen case, the ICC trial chamber, following in the footsteps of several other international criminal courts, took preference of using the residual category of OIA as a crime against humanity to characterize a phenomenon understood as forced marriage. One, the general idea was that the use of this category was justified since the listed labels, primarily sexual slavery and slavery, were not able to fully capture the complexity of the lived experiences and harm done to these women and girls. This judicial development is widely considered an important step in raising accountability for sexual and gender-based crimes. SGBC.2 The majority of scholars writing on this topic have supported the qualification of forced marriage as an OIA. 3. With only a few voices being more critical towards its use. 4. Many labels have circulated in a wide variety of situations and fact patterns have been denominated by concepts such as marriage by capture, servile marriage, forced conjugal associations, war brides, and marriage in absentia. R.5 In the context of human rights law, Arranged marriages are sometimes juxtaposed against forced marriages and are at other times used as synonyms. Six at the national, seven and regional level. Eight forced marriage has been used as an umbrella term to connotate a range of issues. Nine in the context of international criminal law, ICL. This term has come up in relation to very different situations and both the special court for Sierra Leone CSL and the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia. ECCC, case law have labeled the practice in their case law, 10 forced marriage has been understood as a multi-layered or compound crime, 11 that can include rape, enslavement, sexual slavery, forced domestic labor, forced pregnancy, and several acts of sexual violence and forms of inhumane treatment.
12. Some of these acts individually amount to crimes against humanity, while other acts taken separately might not rise up to the level needed to be considered a crime against humanity. There is no doubt that forced marriage can share some characteristics with sexual slavery and enslavement, but nonetheless, several authors concluded that it is, on some points, fundamentally different. 13 other experts have warned against describing this crime as mere sexual violence. 14. As the practice of forced marriage has not been seen as fully explained by any of the single crimes enumerated in the Rome Statute and is considered to be more than the sum of its components. 15. The majority of experts argue that the use of the residual crime label of OIA is justified. 16. Despite the striking differences between some of the fact patterns that are discussed in this article, international case law shows a preference for the OIA label as well. And, now the Ongwen case has solidified this evolution, there are nonetheless several reasons to revisit the legal characterization of forced marriage, as an OIA, despite this seemingly consistent case law, disagreement still exists between experts on whether listed labels are not more adequate to describe the bushwives phenomenon, 17 sellers, for example has very convincingly argued that judges have often overlooked the crime of enslavement to qualified practices of forced marriages. 18. In her view, the interpretation put forward in the Ongwen case, that sexual slavery, a subset of enslavement, now encapsulates enslavement as a type of lesser-included offense is factually and legally ahistorical and bewilderingly incorrect. Point 19. In adopting this approach, judges have failed to understand that enslavement encompasses all exercises of ownership conduct which prevented them from using it properly in the context of forced marriage. 20. This article in many ways takes a similar position, yet presents a different set of arguments. Furthermore, there has not yet been a study evaluating precisely whether the use of the OIA label in relation to a wide diversity of facts is desirable. In the context of the Al-Hassan case, Judges are again using the residual category to label a fact pattern, not like any we have seen before. 21. The judges need to decide upon imposed Islamic marriage during the occupation of Timbuktu by the armed group Ansar Dine. In these marriages, the AQIA members try to involve the family and, in many cases, either the girl or the family was asked for their hand in marriage. 22. In some of the cases, a dowry was even given. 23. This does not mean that the marriage was merely arranged. The evidence only shows that, contrary to abduction by the LRA which did not involve the family at all, the AQIM seemed to have tried to legitimize the marriage by attempting to ask and offer the family something when the marriage was concluded. 24. Another difference is the entirely different position of religion. AQIM wanted to install an Islamic regime in Mali and, in line with this policy, targeted the population in Timbuktu on the basis of religious motives. 25. Considering the broad and residual nature of the OIA category, and the fact that it creates certain risks in terms of the principle of legality, a re-examination of its use in relation to such a diverse range of patterns is more than warranted, based on a systematic examination of the evidence and transcripts of the Ongwen case and in particular the questioning of the wives in the pre-trial Article 56 proceedings. This article's main purpose is to understand how a set of properties led the judges to characterize the Bush wives phenomenon as the OIA of forced marriage. The central examination therefore necessitates a better understanding of the process of characterization in general, drawing from philosophy, of language, and cognitive science. This article evaluates the Aristotelian approach to characterizing the bushwives phenomenon taken by the judges in the Ongwen case. The central argument developed is that the residual category of OIA is not suited for an Aristotelian approach and requires a prototype approach that allows judges to move away from a generic way of labeling different fact patterns. This article seeks to reveal that prototype categorization opens opportunities for judges to diversify interpretation of the OIA category in light of local practices, and to engage with cultural concepts in a more sensitive way. 26. 2. Theories of categorization. As Herbert Hart rightly pointed out, the law must predominantly, but by no means exclusively, refer to classes of persons, and to classes of acts, things and circumstances for it to be successful in terms of operating over vast areas of social life. 
the law depends on a widely diffused capacity to recognize particular acts, things, and circumstances as instances of the general classifications.27, that is why a law has been called a categorization device. 28. Considering that legal language connects the general and the particular through classificatory operations. 29. An examination of what constitutes this process of categorization is needed. In philosophy, categorization has traditionally been approached in an Aristotelian way, which entails that for an object to be included in a category it has to possess the necessary and sufficient properties of that category. 30. Categories are distinct entities, with fixed boundaries. 31. As a result, this Aristotelian approach implies a binary logic. Categories are abstract containers, with things either inside or outside the category. Point three two membership of a category is an all or nothing affair. 33. As these categories have rigid boundaries, this consequently also means that all members of a category are equal. 34. This explanation has very much dominated Western thinking which is evident from the epistemological ontological foundations of a variety of scientific systems. 35. One only needs to think about the linear taxonomy of organisms in biology to understand that we generally categorize through defining properties. 36. It is not until some experts question whether people truly categorize in this way that a new approach emerged. One of those people that started to pierce the Aristotelian approach is the language philosopher, Ludwig Wittgenstein, who introduced the concept of family resemblance to challenge the idea that the world can be carved up on the basis of categories, and that in order to grasp nature it is only a matter of ordering certain objects in these predefined, for some even pre-existing categories. 37 of course, his philosophy of language is much more complex, but it suffices to say for present purposes that at the time of Wittgenstein's work, the awareness grew that categorization is not something done through identifying properties and just seeing whether the object shares a particular list of properties with other category members. 38. Categorization rather came to function through the notion of resemblance, entailing a complicated network of similarities overlapping and crisscrossing, sometimes overall similarities. Sometimes similarities of detail. Point three nine. Wittgenstein's discussion of the notion of a language game explains how we might attribute certain properties to such a game. But even when not all attributes are present, we might still call it a game and play it. A language game is not a game of tennis, but we nonetheless call both a game. Here we see that one of the implications of Wittgenstein's work is that categories do not have fixed boundaries. 40. The language philosopher, John Austin, extended Wittgenstein's insights to the study of the meaning of words. Austin argued that if one wants to understand the senses of a word, properties are of limited use. In relation to the present context, the most important insight from Austin is that it is more helpful to understand meaning having a primary nuclear sense and meanings departing from that center. 41. This insight could very well be understood as the necessary precursor for the understanding in prototype theory of a prototypical meaning. 42. With the development of prototype theory in 1970, Eleanor Rorsch, a psychologist, used in Terralia the concept of family resemblance to make another significant contribution to the theory of categorization. 43. On the basis of several empirical experiments, 44. She found evidence that the process of categorization is not solely about an assessment of whether an object has the necessary properties to belong to the category. It is about how much the object corresponds to a prototype. 45. Categorization is, then, a matter of degree and closeness to the prototypical representative of a category. Categories are composed of a core meaning which consists of the clearest cases, best examples, of the category. 46. Members of decreasing similarity to that core meaning. 47. Prototype theory thereby abandoned. The idea that a category can be strictly based on a set of properties or is defined by rigid borders. 48. These insights were further developed in cognitive science. As such, Lakoff added to the insights of prototype theory by pointing to the importance of imaginative mechanisms, metaphor, metonymy, and imagery. For the purpose of categorization 49, what Rorsch called best examples or prototypes often are expressed through metaphors or drawing analogies. 50. 
Prototype theory thus found that some categories more than others are organized and formed around ideal types. Categorization with these types of categories functions much more through checking, in analogical fashion, whether an object corresponds to that prototype, as a result of which it is understood as a much more graded endeavor. Categorization is furthermore often influenced by what has been termed prototype effect, which means that the extent to which something corresponds to the prototype also impacts whether we consider it to be of the same category. 51. The prototype thus also impacts the constitution of the category. 52. It is illuminating to consider the color experiments of Berlin and K in this context, who demonstrated that certain focal colors were more typical of the color they represented. 53. These experiments show that to understand what is red, a list of attributes does not get you far. It also shows that not all members of the category of red are identical. 54. Despite the disruptive findings of prototype theorists to the theory of categorization, one should, however, not misunderstand categorization to be something that has nothing to do with property attribution. 55. Surely, the fact that we understand a chair to refer to an object with legs that we can sit on, means we understand it basically to respond to those properties. Prototype theory nonetheless allows us to understand certain examples of a chair to be more representative than others, and acknowledges that some categories or concepts are structured around prototypical examples. Most importantly radial categories, 56 in terms of the theory of categorization. This entails a different dynamic that is not limited to a checklist logic, but allows to extend our understanding of categorization to a much more complex and dynamical process, certainly in relation to particularly delicate and culturally sensitive categories. Prototype theorists therefore find the Aristotelian approach to be inappropriate. Interestingly, prototype theory also allows us to think differently about culture and how categorization is affected by it. Rorsch's insights have led several anthropologists to reveal that what is considered to function as a certain prototype for a category is to a large extent culturally determined. 57. It can very well be that the prototypical bird in one culture is a robin but that another culture views a penguin as more prototypical in relation to certain practices such as marriage. The question is even whether the identification of a prototype is not a matter solely understood when acknowledging the cultural context. 58. It did not take long for these cognitive science insights to travel to legal theory. 59. Where surprisingly similar concepts existed already and were used by legal scholars to understand better the functioning of legal categorization. 60. Interestingly, Harter was influenced by Wittgenstein, adopted ideas that overlap with the findings of some of these prototype theorists in his presentation of open texture. He understood there to be a central core of undisputed meaning, and used the term penumbra to signal that some meanings afforded to a concept are further removed from this settled core. 61 penumbra comes remarkably close to the concept of periphery in prototype theory. 62. Apart from these general reflections in legal theory, not many legal scholars have explored the potential of prototype theory for the purpose of legal interpretation. A few exceptions exist to this author's knowledge. 63 but none have delved deeper into the potential it has for the purpose of criminal law, let alone ICL, this more concentric or graded way of thinking about interpretation and categorization, is nonetheless particularly significant to consider in relation to a crime category, such as OIA, given its open and broad nature, the question remains whether it is well suited to be used in an Aristotelian way, as it cannot be so easily defined in terms of a set of properties. Having the contributions of prototype theorists in mind, the OIA label seems best qualified as a radial category, similar to the way in which Lakoff understands the concept of mother to be radial. Also the notion of marriage has the quality of being better approached in terms of these meanings clustered around the central prototype. 64. This is precisely why this article explores how a prototype approach might lead to other possibilities of understanding and have other potential consequences when to label something as forced marriage as OIA. 3. The category of other inhumane ACT and forced marriage. The OIA category is a residual category of crimes against humanity that has been included in every statute of an international criminal tribunal since Nuremberg, 
It is thus as old as crimes against humanity itself. Its meaning has nonetheless evolved. 65. The category has primarily been developed through case law before the International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, ICTY and ICTR, as well as further detailed in relation to forced marriage in both the SCSL and ECCC's case law. In the Celebacy case, the ICTY trial chamber turned to the human rights prohibitions on torture and ill treatment 66 to find that inhumane treatment although falling short of being considered torture, 67 nonetheless qualifies as an OIA, since it causes serious mental or physical suffering or injury, or constitutes a serious attack on human dignity. 68 in the Cordican Circus appeal judgment, judges further fleshed out that a case by case assessment needs to examine the individual circumstances and see whether the acts caused serious bodily or mental harm. 69 the Kiradzic trial chamber added that the act must be of a similar seriousness to the other enumerated acts. 70 ICTR judges approached the category in a similar vein, 71 stating that the acts have to be similar in nature, character, gravity, and seriousness. 72 a range of conduct ranging from forced nudity, 73 to the desecration of corpses, 74 has been addressed within this category. Some of the acts previously considered OIA, now feature as listed crimes in the Rome Statute, such as enforced disappearance, 75 forcible transfer or displacement, 76 an enforced prostitution, 77 at the ICTY, concerns arose as to the compatibility of this category with the principle of legality, 78 OAI could potentially subsume a broad range of criminal behavior, and in that sense was considered to lack sufficient clarity, precision and definiteness. 79. It is therefore not surprising that legislators and judges have introduced limitations to this category. The articulation of this category in the Rome Statute is the result of this history. Article 7, 1, K, of the Rome Statute details. The perpetrator inflicted great suffering or serious injury to body or to mental or physical health. Such act was of a character similar to any other act referred to in Article 7, Paragraph 1, of the Statute. While this category provides leeway to accommodate forms of inhumane conduct not otherwise prohibited, 80 the drafters argued that the legality principle needed limits to be set. 81 precisely for this purpose, some of the tribunal's jurisprudential limitations have found their way into the elements of crimes. 82 first, the elements of crimes introduced a threshold requiring the act to cause a certain amount of suffering on the part of the victim. Point 83 this assessment necessitates the judge to look at the degree of harm. 84. The ICTY trial chamber explained that the harm need not be permanent or irremediable but must nonetheless go beyond temporary unhappiness, embarrassment or humiliation. 85. This means that a grave and long term disadvantage to a person's ability to live a normal and constructive life qualifies as an OIA. 86. The ICC pre-trial chamber in the Mathura. Kenyatta and Ali Case found that the victims had suffered greatly by witnessing the killing and mutilation of their family members. 87. Secondly, OIA is an adjustum generis category, requiring an assessment of similarity of the listed acts, with those considered under the residual clause. This often involves analogical reasoning. The analogy introduced here is that the acts have to be similar in character. The ICC trial chamber specified that character should be evaluated in terms of nature, Harm suffered and protected interests involved. 88. Totally. The introduction of the word other has a decisive impact on the understanding of the residual clause. Acts considered under the listed acts cannot be simultaneously considered OAI. 89. Although the elements of crimes lists no such separate material element, ICC judges have stressed the subsidiary relationship of OIA to the listed acts. 90. Although it is not required that the conduct in question, in its entirety, falls completely outside any act under Article 7, 1, J, 91 AM qualification as an OIA is not possible when there is no materially distinct element. 92. This means that judges have to walk a thin line between proving the similarity in terms of nature and gravity, while at the same time making sure that the conduct is also different from the enumerated acts, because otherwise it violates the residual character of OIA. 
93 he then argued that the standard of the materially distinct element is similar to the one used in relation to cumulative convictions. 94 this way of interpreting Article 7, 1, K, enhances legality conform interpretations, is in line with the residual nature of the category, and protects against and critically enlarging the scope of crimes against humanity. 95. One of the particular difficulties surrounding this category is the doubt as to whether it can tackle sexual violence not captured under Article 7, 1, G, S listed labels. That paragraph introduces its own residual category other forms of sexual violence. Consequently, contention exists on how these two categories relate to each other. It is argued that the residual category of paragraph, G, should be used to deal with sexual crimes exclusively. As mentioned in the introduction, this category has been used by several international institutions to qualify forced marriage, but it is uncontested that the SCSL has been most influential in shaping the current jurisprudential understanding of the crime as OIA. 96 During the Sierra Leone Civil War, 1991-2002, to a pattern of young girls being abducted, taken to the bush and held as the wives of rebel commanders emerged, 97 It was not doubted that this practice entailed sexual violence. However, the question of whether there was not more to the phenomenon quickly emerged. Several scholars discussed the sociological or anthropological characteristics of the phenomenon of Bush wives. 98 As well as commented on the labeling. 99 Three SCSL cases label the Bush wives phenomenon, the AFRC case, the rough case and the case against Charles Taylor. In the AFRC case, there was initially no inclusion of the charge of OIA, but because the prosecution was extensively influenced by the two renowned experts, that is, Michael Scharf and Zainab Hawa Bangura, who both advocated in favor of the use of OIA, the charges were amended, 100 as a result, the qualification as OIA was central on appeal, whereas the trial chamber in the AFRC case qualified the Bushwives phenomenon as sexual slavery, 101, the appeals chamber in 2008 overturned this interpretation, and it's so largely guided by the findings set out in the Bangura report, which were also reflected in the separate opinion of Judge Doherty attached to the trial judgment. It distinguishes sexual slavery from forced marriage on the basis of two distinct characteristics. First, forced marriage involves a perpetrator compelling a person by force or by threat of force, through the words or conduct of the perpetrator or those associated with him, into a conjugal association with another person, resulting in great suffering or serious physical or mental injury on the part of the victim. Second, unlike sexual slavery, force marriage implies a relationship of exclusivity between the husband and wife, which could lead to disciplinary consequences for breach of this exclusive arrangement. These distinctions imply that forced marriage is not predominantly a sexual crime. 102. The SCSL Appeals Chamber concluded that the physical injury, repeated acts of rape and sexual violence, forced labor, corporal punishment, psychological trauma, being forced to watch the killing or mutilation of close family members, and stigmatization, the label of wife resulted in them, and their children being ostracized from their communities 103, suffered by these girls justified the use of OAI. Shortly after this judgment, the SCSL trial chamber in the rough case concluded that the phenomenon of Bush wives was well known and understood and should indeed be qualified as OIA. 104. This approach reveals that there are essentially two elements that stand out to demonstrate how sexual slavery and forced marriage are different. 1. The exclusivity which is the result of the forced conjugal association and 2. The different harm which breaks down in the non-sexual harm that is not captured in sexual slavery, as well as the stigmatization which is different for wives compared to other rebel victims. Surprisingly, the SCSL judges at no point entertained the idea that this could be captured by the label of enslavement. What is also noticeable is that despite the judges in both cases analyzing pre-conflict and peacetime, arranged marriages in Sierra Leone, and comparing them with the wartime phenomenon of bush wives. The absence of an official ceremony of any form, or the consent of the parents in the context of the bush wives, 105 were not relevant in deciding that this needs to be labeled as forced marriage. If a label of marriage is used, 
one needs to at least consider how the marriage practice is similar to a cultural practice of marriage. It can thus be questioned whether setting apart from the pre-war marriage makes us understand better when the label is fitting to the criminal phenomenon. Another observation is that the judge's reasoning in justifying the use of BOIA centered on showing how the phenomenon is distinct. Both the distinctiveness and the similarity were primarily approached through a checklist of attributes, exemplifying a more Aristotelian approach. This drew away the attention from a discussion on what constituted the prototype marriage in Sierra Leone's culture. Although the SCSL judges do find the label of wife to be important, this was not connected to the meaning of marriage. The label of marriage and the label of wife might not mean the same thing, as will again become clear in the ICC's cases. As a concluding chapter to the SCSL's jurisprudence, the Taylor trial judgment held that forced marriage is not a distinct crime against humanity of OIA, but is a form of sexual slavery, 106 in that judgment. Witness testimony is cited in the absence of any sort of marriage ceremony t. The only ceremony is to go and sleep. Point one zero seven. Whereas the judges did not label the phenomenon as enslavement, they do provide a detailed assessment of how the rights of ownership were exercised and constituted part of the actus reus of sexual slavery. Also, the ECCC has had several occasions to categorize forced marriage practices. One hundred and eight in two thousand and eighteen. The ECCC delivered a judgment in case 002 in which the issue of forced marriages as crimes against humanity arose, 109 the ECCC, which has a less elaborate legal basis for sexual and gender-based crimes, only the crime of rape is specifically listed as a crime against humanity in its statute 110, gave a very elaborate assessment of pre- Revolution marriages before 1975 as a traditional family affair and religious practice, 111, the trial chamber explained that Mayor Regime's policy of transformation of these traditional marriage practices to fit the communist ideology, 112 an increase of population was required, 113 and the communists saw marriage as a way to increase sexual interactions, 114 therefore, and under close oversight of the communist party, 115, the traditional family practices were replaced by collective marriage ceremonies with multiple couples being married at once. 116. These ceremonies were rid of any Buddhist elements and primarily emphasized the commitment toward the communist ideology. 117. Once the marriage was concluded, the emphasis was on procreation. Couples often only shared a home for the purpose of making children and in some cases, they even had forced sexual intercourse under supervision. 118, the trial chamber painted a very detailed picture of this explicit marriage policy and found these couples were the victims of a widespread climate of fear making it impossible for them to genuinely consent. 119, the anchor instructions were given under the threat of being killed if they refused to marry. 120 victims felt that they were obliged to have sexual intercourse which caused serious mental or physical suffering or injury or constituted a serious attack on the human dignity of the victims. Point one two one. The ECCC judges also used the OIA label and adopted an approach which has Aristotelian characteristics. It uses the elements set out by the SCSL, which were also copied by the Ongwen pre-trial chamber, and focuses on 1. The imposition of marriage, 2. The social stigma, and 3. The exclusivity as attributes of forced marriage, 122. The judges nonetheless go beyond a mere checklist of attributes of the OIA category and underscore the necessity of examining the factual specifics of the case. The vast discussion of the marriage practices shows an engagement with a local practice that is much more sensitive to understanding how the Ankara instructions perverted the cultural practice of marriage and alter the prototypical marriage that existed prior to Khmer Rouge rule. In 2022, the ECCC entered its final chapter in terms of its case law on forced marriage with the appeal chamber confirming Samphan Ku's conviction for forced marriages as other inhumane acts. 123 The judges, however, reversed the trial chamber's findings excluding men as victims of rape into these marriages. Despite being interesting from the point of view of characterization, this jurisprudential development is not central to this article's further analysis.
As the next section shows, the Ongwen case primarily followed the SCSL's approach and articulated a classical Aristotelian way of characterization similar to the one developed by its predecessors. For characterization as an OIA, three properties or material elements need to be met, the similar gravity requirement, the similar character requirement, and the requirement of a materially distinct element. Four, the Bushwives phenomenon in the ONGWE in case. The LRA's kidnapping of young girls to use them as household servants, child soldiers and bushwives was central to the Ongwen case. The judicial reasoning in the Ongwen case reveals an Aristotelian approach verifying whether the bushwives phenomenon corresponds to three properties of the OIA category. A. The similar gravity stroke equal harm requirement. B. The similar character requirement. And C. The requirement of a materially distinct element. The problematic elements of this approach are deconstructed in order to set the scene for an alternative prototype approach. A. The similar gravity requirement. The ICC judges illuminated that the harm done by forced marriages needs to be both equally severe, as well as distinct from the harm created by other crimes. In its assessment of the similar gravity requirement, the judges often use the distinctiveness of the phenomenon to discuss the severity of the acts. This is why the elements first need to be discussed together before, also attributing a separate section to the element of distinctiveness, the Ongwen Pre. Trial Chamber relied on both SCSL 124 and ECCC Judgments 125 to find that forcing the victims to serve as conjugal partner can cause great suffering. 126. The Trial Chamber detailed that the harm suffered from forced marriage can consist of being ostracized from the community, mental trauma, a serious attack on the victim's dignity, and the deprivation of the victim's fundamental rights to choose his or her spouse. Point one two seven. This was different, and in some ways more severe than the harm of child soldiers or the Ting Tings, or household serfs, considered sexual slaves. Another reason to resort to the residual category is that forced marriages create additional harm because they violate the basic right to consensually marry and establish a family. 128 The Ongwen Trial Chamber found that in some cases the community sees the victim as legitimate spouse, and even the victim themselves consider themselves as bound. 129 This harm is distinct from the harm that comes from violating the physical or sexual integrity or personal liberty, a value that is traditionally protected by the sexual crimes such as sexual slavery. 130 This was said in similar wording in the Al-Hassan case. 131 A third element that has proven important is the issue of stigmatization and trauma of the victims. The Ongwen trial chamber found that the victims of forced marriage suffer trauma and stigma beyond that caused by being a rape victim alone. Point one three two. It is not clear how the evidence supports that claim as the chamber only refers to the Al-Hassan confirmation of charges decision. In the reference paragraph of that decision, the pre-trial chamber indeed finds the stigmatization of victims of forced marriage BN particular and touches upon the social dimension. 133. The label of wife results in the victim being seen in a specific way by the communities. 134. Expert testimony indicated that harm and trauma affected all returnees, 135 but that some suffered more because they were women, 136 and that the victims of SGBC were particularly affected, 137 Reichiter explained that each individual has a different capacity for the chronicity of symptoms, and almost no survivor of sexual violence who hasn't had it impact them negatively, or chronically. Point one three eight. This seems to indicate that although the individual effects of SGBC varied, all returnees are affected, and there is no sensible way in making distinctions between the degree of harm apart from at the individual level. The testimony of P0236, herself a wife of Ongwen, seemed to have corroborated this point as she found that she was doing worse than those not abducted primarily because of her injuries and lack of education, and not necessarily because of the fact that she was a wife. 139. If there is one clear element that resulted in a different stigmatization as well as more difficulty to rehabilitate was whether the girls returned with children or not. Several experts mentioned this as a distinctive problem as the children were often rejected by the community as well as the family of the mother, as they are seen as rebel children. 
140 women who return to the community with children tended to experience more shame, more stigma, more social isolation. Point one four one. The public evidence does not substantiate this differentiation in harm between wives and other SGBC victims. Despite the possibility that the answers are in the confidential evidence, it consists of a significant methodological problem in that the relevant passages in the judgment are only substantiated by external precedent. The claim is proved by referring to the Al-Hassan confirmation of charges decision, which in turn relied on the Ongwen confirmation of charges decision, rather than evidence. This is extremely problematic as the finding on trauma of victims is an evidentiary matter, entirely, and is also completely case-specific. B. The similar character requirement. The next requirement is that an OIA needs to be of a similar character to the listed crimes. Footnote 30 of the Elements of Crimes details that the character refers to the nature and gravity of the act. The similar character has been articulated in terms of harm and protected interest involved. Point 142 Given that this restriction was inserted because of a desire to adhere to the principle of legality, the Ongwen trial judgment clarifies that Article 7. 1. K. Must be interpreted consistent with the essence of the offence, and in a manner which could have been reasonably foreseen. Point 143. Several aspects have had an influence on proving the similarity in nature of the conduct. First, the link is often made to human rights to the extent that a serious violation of human rights can be considered conduct similar in nature. 144. It has even been argued that OIA is precisely intended to cover serious violations of human rights not specifically enumerated. Point 145. Secondly, assessing whether the inhumaneness of the acts is similar has also been connected to the notion of human dignity. 146. And understood as encompassing certain serious transgressions against human dignity. Point 147. This was reflected in the assessment of the Bush wives phenomenon by the Ongwen Pri trial chamber whose reasoning had traces of human rights and human dignity language. The pre-trial judges highlighted that the wives' basic right to consensually marry and establish a family was violated. 148 The judges found that by forcing the victims into conjugal relationships, they endured serious physical or mental suffering or injury, or a serious attack on human dignity of a degree of gravity comparable to that of other crimes against humanity. 149 Fortunately, the reference to human dignity was not taken over by the trial chamber. For reasons outside of the confines of this article, women's rights supporters at the negotiation table at the Rome Conference advocated to disconnect the language of honor and dignity from the SGBC. It would be opposing these efforts to reintroduce this terminology via the OIA category. 150. In setting up the analogical reasoning required in the context of this category, the pre-trial judges in the Ongwen case examined primarily the similarity with sexual slavery and focused on whether the conduct, i.e. forcing the women to serve as conjugal partners to himself and other LRA fighters in the Sinia Brigade, constituted an OIA or whether it is subsumed by the crime of sexual slavery, 151, for the purpose it relied first on the SCSL case law, because of the very similar factual allegations, an identical legal question point 152 despite the different fact, pattern, the judges referred to the ECCC case law, as also recognizing forced marriage as an OIA, 153 in the subsequent paragraph the tone remarkably, changes and judges set out that the conduct may, per se or in the abstract qualify as OIA, it is furthermore stated that forced marriage will generally be committed in circumstances in which the victim is also sexually or otherwise enslaved. Point 154. This explanation seems to prove the overlap more than it sets the difference apart. And although it is understandable that the crime of sexual slavery is chosen in order to contrast better the non-sexual side of forced marriage, it would have been preferable to assess the phenomenon in the context of the enslavement provision and to at least discuss why the phenomenon is not captured by this criminalization, a thorough assessment of the enslavement label remains absent from the Ongwen case. See the requirement of a materially distinct element. The case law has added a third constitutive element. The OIA category only applies when other provisions fail, and when there is a materially distinct element. In the Ongwen case, the judges relied on three factors to prove the distinctiveness of the phenomenon. 
The first differentiating factor constitutes the imposition of marriage, which the pre-trial chamber explained as the imposition, regardless of the will of the victim, of duties that are associated with marriage, as well as of the social status of the perpetrator's wife. 155. The fact that these marriages were not recognized under national law in Uganda, and were considered illegal in nature, was irrelevant to the court. 156. The practice of forced marriage violated the right to consensually marry and establish a family. 157. This basic right was the value, distinct from, for example, physical or sexual integrity, or personal liberty, that demands protection through OIA. 158. In one part of the Ongwen judgment, the judges chose to define marriage as creating a status based on a consensual and contractual relationship. It is an institution and also an act or right. 159. This is difficult to square with another passage in which it was simply found that n. a traditional rituals of marriage were observed. 160. The judges furthermore primarily used external precedent and thereby relied on cases with substantially different facts to substantiate their reasoning. In this manner, it remained unclear how the perversion of marriage in the LRA occurred, as there was no real elaboration on what makes these marriages, marriages, 161. The judges did not clarify how this practice of marriage is understood by the community and culture. Instead, the existence of a marriage is immediately connected to the harm of the victim and the consequent social stigma. 162 Most of the wives testified that there was no ceremonial side to the marriage. They explained how the period as wife generally started by being called upon to share the bed with Owen. 163 Although the LRA had a ceremony of smearing sheer butter on new recruits as a general initiation ritual. 164 And this ritual was also used in relation to one of the wives who testified 165 It was not considered a ceremonial aspect of marriage. The judges leave entirely implicit how the right or act of marriage fits within, or differs from the actually culture, and how the marriages were marked by something culturally embedded within the LRA, or Ugandan culture. The second element that makes forced marriage a distinct crime is the exclusivity of the forced conjugal relationship. Following SCSL precedent, the Ongwen pre-trial chamber found that unlike sexual slavery, forced marriage implies a relationship of exclusivity between the husband and wife, which could lead to disciplinary consequences for breach of this exclusive arrangement and, therefore, is not predominantly a sexual crime. 166 The trial chamber confirmed that Ongwen so called wives had to maintain an exclusive conjugal relationship with him. 167 and that this exclusivity was enforced by the threat of severe punishment, or even death. 168. The concept of exclusivity was connected to the duties that are associated with marriage. 169. Despite the fact that assertion of exclusivity is also understood as one of the factors indicative of enslavement, the chamber nonetheless did not qualify the practice as enslavement and decided against framing the conjugal duties as well as the exclusivity as flowing from the rights of ownership. The trial chamber judges found it sufficient to differentiate OIA from sexual slavery. 170. It is remarkable that the judges found it unnecessary to explain how exclusivity is indicative of a marriage in a case that takes place in a country where polygamy is legal. The fact that exclusivity is seen as an attribute of marriage by the judges seems to be the result of a list of attributes being unduly copied from other cases, most importantly the SCSL cases. Again, this seems to be partly the result of the checklist logic of the Aristotelian approach, which furthermore seems to be infused with a Western perspective on marriage. Whether exclusivity is effectively something that sets apart a marriage in every culture can be doubted. This issue could potentially be addressed when having a more detailed look into the cultural practices which is precisely where the prototype theory offers a possible solution. Lastly, the Ongwen trial judgment shows that the conjugal union was found to result in a harm that is different from the harm done by other crimes. It consists of being ostracized from the community, mental trauma, the serious attack on the victim's dignity, and the deprivation of the victim's fundamental rights to choose his or her spouse. The idea is that the stigmatization the ability to rehabilitate and reintegrate in society is different in relation to these bushwives.
The problem with the judicial reasoning of a consequent social stigma is that it is each time supported by precedent and not with evidence. 171. The review of the transcripts and expert testimonies did not reveal evidence of a distinct stigma. Hence, it is not clear how the harm is different for the victims that became wives compared to other SGBC victims. 5. Thinking differently about categorization, the prototype theory. This article does not seek to criticize the fact that the use of OIA requires that on the one hand, the crime has to be distinct from the listed crimes, but on the other hand needs to be similar in terms of severity and character as the listed crimes. Also, the fact that this analogical reasoning necessitates that the conduct being characterized as OIA needs to be consistent with the essence of the offense, and that incorporation needs to be reasonably foreseen, is not problematic. 172. The critique formulated is precisely directed at how the distinctiveness and similarity assessment is conducted. The reason for exploring insights from the prototype theory is not to posit a better alternative interpretation of the bushwives phenomenon. The intention is only to formulate suggestions for SEC judges that are confronted with highly cultural practices to think differently about how such cultural practices can meaningfully be characterized. When addressing the cultural practice of marriage through the lens of the OIA, the question also arises to what extent distinctiveness and similarity are not better understood in terms of the distance or closeness from a prototype of marriage in a certain culture. This way we are inserting a prototype logic to the categorization while not entirely getting rid of properties. As explained in section 2, prototype theory does not argue that defining a concept through properties is superfluous. It rather proposes we think beyond the properties-based logic. In the present case, addressing OIA through the properties of harm only does not enable us to understand the concept of marriage. If the judges involved in the Ongwen case argue that the imposition of marriage is what makes the phenomenon distinct from slavery, an assessment of the prototypical marriage in the Ugandan culture, and actually practice, is needed to clarify that markers of marriage are present. Although it might be argued that the practice need not be formal or ceremonial, there at least has to be an element showing it is a marriage. The judges did not engage with how pre-conflict marriages were organized, and the LRA sought to pervert the Institute of Marriage. Furthermore, Tim Allen, an expert in development anthropology, testified on the 19th century custom of marriage by capture, and highlighted how it could have been mistaken with the LRA abductions. The judges could have asked him to explore how this actually practice uses the label of Bush wives. 173 in this context, the ICC judges could have taken note of the ECCC's detailed explanation of how the state policy of marriage imposed by the Mayor Rouge regime impacted the cultural practices in pre-revolution Cambodia and given a similar in-depth analysis, clearly lacking in the trial judgment, as said in section 2. The concept of marriage understood as a radial category allows us to assess how the bushwives phenomenon fits the marriage category. In my view, there are little arguments to argue that it is a prototypical example of a marriage, given the lack of ceremonial or religious practices within the LRA connected to the capturing of these girls. I do not see how it comes close to being argued as a marriage. A lot of emphasis also lies on the notion of exclusivity as a property of marriage. Here again the limits of an Aristotelian approach become clear. To what extent is exclusivity even something that sets apart marriage as in actually culture? Exclusivity how it is portrayed in the judgment seems a property of a Western concept of marriage, given that this property was copied from the SCSL case law, in any event, suggests a lack of assessment of the cultural practice at hand. Another aspect that the trial judgment conflates is the difference between the wives that were willingly married and still supported Ongwen and those not seeing themselves as Ongwen's wives. The labeling of both instances as forced marriage again shows a lack of understanding of how marriage is locally understood. In a similar way, the trial judges also set out the notion of exclusivity as a distinct characteristic of forced marriage, but do not discuss how exclusivity is a marker of the marriage practices in Uganda. It might be that marriage is an exclusive matter in several cultures, but in many parts of the world polygamous marriages are still practiced. The notion of exclusivity was copied from case law, rather than explained through the facts of the case. 
It thereby remains unclarified how the cultural dimension of marriage, particularly in Uganda, plays out in the LRA. Another element that was used by the ICC judges to underscore the distinctiveness was the different harm, which was essentially understood as a different social stigma that the wives faced. As elaborately discussed above, it is unclear how the status of these wives made them suffer differently than the other returnees. These elements trigger the question of whether a prototype approach would not have revealed that the Bush wives phenomenon is anything but a prototypical example of marriage. Even more so, it could be argued that it is a much more prototypical example of enslavement. In any event, the trial chamber has not revealed sufficiently what the prototype of forced marriage is and how the Bush wives correspond to it. The search for a forced marriage prototype in that regard remains unfruitful. 6. A forward-looking conclusion the Al Hassan case. The popularity of OIA seems guided by its ability to incorporate more than one type of harm. By hoping to express the complex harms suffered by the victims, this category is used because it allows to build a broad narrative and is not restrained to reflect, for example, the sexual side of the conduct alone. While not wanting to underestimate the potential of this category, it is wise to delimitate the category and assess the requirement of distinctiveness as well as similarity through a cultural lens. It is in relation to this point that the prototype theory might open avenues for a more culturally sensitive approach. When something is labeled as marriage, it should bear similarity to a cultural practice of marriage. The judges in the Ongwin case remain too vague on this point. In the Al-Hassan case, the chief of the Islamic police and Al-Qaeda member in the Islamic Maghreb AQIM, Stand trial for his participation in the policy of forced marriages of the girls of Timbuktu, to the extent that most of the girls were taken by force, or under the threat of force, the conduct resembles the conduct of the LRA. The role of the family was nonetheless entirely different than in Uganda. 174 often the AQIA members tried to involve the family. In many cases, as mentioned above, the family was asked for their hand in marriage. 175 and sometimes even a dowry was given. 176. The AQIM tried to legitimize the marriage by affording a role to the family as is common in Arab culture. 177. Another difference with Uganda is the entirely different position of religion. AQIM wanted to install an Islamic regime in Mali and targeted the population in Timbuktu on the basis of religious motives. 178 as such. The jihadists wanted to marry the local population in order to change the composition of the population as well as make them more in favor of the religious regime. Furthermore, there was sometimes mention of marriage ceremonies. 179 The LRA marriages were seemingly less religious or ceremonial in nature. Also, the Al-Hassan pre-trial chamber justified its use of OIA on the basis of the distinctness of the crime. The chamber finds that the crime of forced marriage falls within the category of other inhumane acts given that it is distinct from the other crimes covered by the statute in terms of conduct, interests protected, harms suffered and objectives sought, and in that way goes beyond a solely sexual relationship. The difference lies in the imposition of a marriage, a very specific aspect of the relationship between the perpetrator and the victim, who hereby becomes a spouse.180. The marital status was assessed in terms of its social dimension and how the victim was publicly and privately portrayed as spouse. 181. The Al-Hassan pre-trial chamber copied the wording of the Ongwen pre-trial chamber and articulated this element in terms of violating the right to marry. 182. The pre-trial chamber required no formal marriage. 183. And found that the presence of certain conceptions of the institution of marriage sufficed. 184. It was nonetheless argued that the respect of certain traditions could be an indication of marriage. 185. As such, the judges in the Al Hassan case were more convincing in arguing that markers of marriage were present. And we have a much better idea of what culturally was associated with a prototypical marriage. 186. Also, the role of the Islamic police as well as the Islamic tribunal in setting and controlling the matrimonial rules was examined. 187 in this context. The pre-trial chamber elaborated on pre-conflict marriage, which made the reasoning more convincing. 188 Another remarkable aspect is that the notion of exclusivity is formulated as indicia from which a forced marriage can be inferred. 
In this vein, the pretrial chamber adopted a system of indicia similar to the one developed in relation 2.189, it is in any event better that exclusivity is not simply seen as a characteristic of marriage, as not all cultures might see this summary, although it is too early to tell in relation to the El Hassan case. It can only be hoped that the trial chamber discusses the phenomenon in factual terms, and makes understandable how the practice of marriage is truly a marriage. The confirmation of charges decision already reveals some progress in this direction, and the judges have engaged much more with understanding the local practices of marriages. The trial chamber should think about what the prototype of marriage is and how the label of forced marriage engages with the cultural practices. It is difficult to shake the impression that in the Ongwen case, the judges tried everything to not get caught in a discussion of local practices and culture. It is impossible to tell whether this was driven by a fear for being overly Western-centered. But the fact that this critique has been formulated against the court before seems to suggest that they wanted to stay away from pronouncing on local practices. What we now see as a result is that a very different set of practices are generically labeled as forced marriage under OIA. In most cases, the ECCC's assessment being the exception, we are left to wonder how the local culture understands marriages and what they think of the use of the label marriage. While some might see this as a welcome solidification of jurisprudence, this examination hopefully has provided judges with reasons to search for a prototype of crime categories in order to diversify interpretation. Of course, there is a limit to which an outsider can judge these cases on its merits, as some information available to the judges is limited to the public. The public judicial reasoning nonetheless has unconvincingly demonstrated that marriage was imposed at the LRA. When reading through the transcripts of the Ongwen case, it is difficult to not understand this practice as a prototypical example of enslavement. One wonders whether an approach that would have considered addressing similarity and distinctiveness from the listed labels through closeness and distance of the practice of forced marriage from the local cultural practice might have led to a different outcome. This would in any event necessitate input from experts of the Anchali culture for future cases, such engagement might also respond to the criticism that the court adopts a too western centered vision, a tailor-made interpretation with prototypical and cultural elements being taken into account, at least has a chance to lead to a more culturally sensitive outcome. This article has admittedly only scratched the surface of how the prototype approach can solve some of the interpretational issues we are facing in ICL. It nonetheless hopes to show that it is all the more pressing to further examine these types of interdisciplinary perspectives in order to tackle some of the continuous criticism that the International Criminal Justice Project is facing. In that regard, the prototype theory offers new pathways to move away from generic and often Western-centered interpretations and to think differently about how to put cultural practices into criminal categories. Copyright the author, S. 2024, published by Oxford University Press. This is an open access article distributed under the terms of the Creative Commons Attribution License HTTPS colon slash slash creativeacommons.org slash licenses slash by slash four dot zero slash which permits unrestricted reuse, distribution and reproduction in any medium, provided the original work is properly cited. Ligeia Kwakalbin, In Search of the Prototype of Forced Marriage, The Ongwen Case and the Bushwives Phenomenon, Journal of International Criminal Justice, 2024, Key 023, https colon, slash slash, doi, dot org, slash 10, dot 1093, slash jik j, slash m key 023.